Continue our discussion on uh, containers. And again, containers is the solution for us to be able to back up some programs, dependencies, all the requirements altogether, and be able to ship it to different machines, perhaps different operating systems, and so on and so forth. Now, containers is something like saying on a operating system but you know an operating system world we have linux Mic uh, microsoft macintosh operating system and so on so forth we in fact have more like you know android for our phones different operating systems for different users for all different comparisons and so on and so forth containers are also the same thing i've went through this earlier one thing I want to get your attention to is also we have what's called uh, singularity, Docker and singularity. They are both two solutions. Okay. So and again, think about it as Microsoft and Macintosh. Now Docker, as said earlier, said, I said earlier, is kind of the that uh, subtype of some type or specific type of operating system, we can establish uh, some storage space using volume in both. And then we have what's called Docker file. In singularity, we call it recipe. We have an image in both Docker file image and then container is our realization uh, uh, of what we end up running. So what are the differences between Singularity and Docker? This is the logo icon for Docker, and this is for Singularity. Those are two solutions that you can go and download and start working with and playing with, okay? So for Docker, uh, they, they are both containerization technologies, but they had different primary use cases. So think about uh, the different technologies that we discussed before. Sometimes we had technology development because you know this is most advanced now. We have more resources, but sometimes pretty much that you you know, depending on the use case, especially when we talk about the third generation sequencing versus second generation sequencing. Sometimes you may go with this or that, and so on and so forth. So. Although I've jumped a little bit to take it to technology, let's go back to these containerization technologies. We have Dockers and Singularity. Docker initially is designed for developers and system administrators. Uh, the idea is how we can establish what's called the microservice architecture. And in this microservice architecture, we are looking to uh, run an application on many uh, nodes, okay, on the cloud, for example. Now, Singularity is more fine-tuned for HPC environment, high-performance computing and scientific workloads. Um, Docker, for example, are generally portable, which means we can put them on uh, different operating systems but they still require some dependencies on running the Docker daemon, which is the thread or the system or the program that need to be there. So the operating system should be aware of the Docker and the Docker software need to be there to run. Singularity containers are often a single file, so they are highly portable, uh, specifically in the high performance computing. So we're not looking at extra dependencies as in the case of uh, Docker. Um, one of the things that is important to bring attention to is also is that Docker has its own networking model. 
while Singularity uses the host's network directly without the need to create what's called virtual networks. And again, this is something else makes them uh, more suitable for high performance uh, computing, high performance computing. Now, one thing also I want to mention about uh, Docker files, Docker solutions, that we usually require or typically require what's called root privilege. And again, running things as a pseudo user or using the root privilege. This can bring uh, some security risks and sometimes uh, you cannot use it actually because I'm on the discovery system. So I'm going to run the Docker file, for example, if I would need uh, a Docker container or if I would need root privileges, nobody's going to give me that. Okay. Uh, there have been efforts to run Docker containers with, that, with lower privileges. Singularity uh, is designed with different security model in mind. And again, as we speak about singularity, uh, is more meant for high performance computing, uh, more easy interaction with the host system. And it does not grant any user inside the container elevated privileges on the host system. So these are some examples or two well-known recognized uh, solutions that we can use. Now, it may still a little bit not clear until one starts actually using them, okay? But the way I want you to think about it is as you write a piece of code, you're going to write a piece of file that calls that code. And again, not only that. So if I'm writing a Docker file, what I'm going to have inside the Docker file? I'm going to say pull, for example. Uh, I may say pull. Uh, Ubuntu, which is one Linux operating system. Um, you know, just numbers, okay? I'm coming up with numbers and just kind of text to give you the idea. Pull Ubuntu, I don't know, maybe 20? 22, for example. Okay, version 22. Which means I don't care about what's my operating system. What is my operating system? I don't care. I'm just going to pull whatever I need to run the software. Is that going to run on Windows, Mac, any other operating system? Well, yes, that is the container. That's the beauty of containers. Not only this, I'm going to say pull Ubuntu. And similar to module load that we use in Discovery to load uh, okay, some modules, although those have been installed for us, here I can go and say apt install. So install Python. Now, nowadays, mostly we're using Python 3, but no, I'm going to require Python 2.7 here. And then I'm going to call my program, run my pipeline. Now, this is the piece of code that you have written or pipeline. OK, yet the dependencies that we're going to install install dependency one, two, three, four, are the instructions that will be made here. So every time we run the Docker file, this would be executed again and again, but it's light in the sense that, you know, it's going to be uh, reasonable as compared to running a virtual machine. So here is one question for you, or treasure hunt question. I hope you see the, uh, the point of Dockerfile and Singularity and other containerization solutions. Well, my question for you, what is the difference between writing a piece of code and writing a Docker file? Okay. Now, remember, when you have actually practiced some of these instructions, when you use Conda on Discovery, the tutorials that were shared as part of the in-class activities, you were asked to module to 
create a virtual environment and then to module load and start loading some specific software versions inside that one. While you were writing some instructions, sort of dealing with an interface for that system, Dockerfile is the way to sort of that in a very systematic way through making written instructions. So there are many resources for researchers to go and check online, for example, container images. Uh, as I said in my Docker file, this was sort of the first thing, pull. You may decide to pull a clear, clean Ubuntu image, or maybe Ubuntu bioinform slash bioinformatics image that somebody else did, which comes with all the dependencies, so I don't need to install any other software. So if I go to Docker online repository, I end up uh, finding uh, useful resources. You yourself can uh, provide or share uh, your own image that you think, you know what, this image is useful to be shared with other scientists. And this is eventually going to allow us for the best standards for reproducibility research and analysis. Imagine this, and again, you are doing and dealing with this practice, which is reading this paper, going to the GitHub link, you still need to pull the code and install the dependencies. In the readme file, you see instructions on to install and do and run. Imagine that you don't need to do all of this. You basically download the Docker file, click on it, and everything starts executing. Okay. Now, this is some simplification. Usually, not directly clicking. But anyway, it is the, this is the idea to make our life easy, really, indeed, to make our life easy. The concept might be new to some of us or many of us, but believe me, it is really meant to make our life very easy when it comes to executing software and making it live almost forever. Like I had my own code before. That is one thing, a code repository, and a code with a Docker image, that's something neat. Why? Whatever dependencies I had to struggle with, I don't need others to struggle with, so I'm going to share with them Docker image. Once we decide we have a container image, we want to deploy it. Okay, we want to run it on some resources. That could be, you know, once you have this Docker image file or singularity um, recipe, once you have those files or images, you can go and uh, deploy them. And deployment here um, is part of what's called uh, DevOps. You might have heard of this term, DevOps. Okay, it's a software engineering term. But this is where software engineers or uh, you know professionals are going to come and take these files and make sure they are can be deployed on the needed resources because you can deploy these in the cloud on the high edge perform high performance computing and so on and so forth. Make sure that we have the proper setup. So now we discussed um, high performance computing, containerizations. And now we're going to finish with the last part, which is on pipelines. And you know, personally, the first time I hear about pipeline, I said it can't be just a pipeline. This is computer world. Everything is complicated. It should be complicated. So, I mean, this is this is what happens with me sometimes for one reason or another. But it's not pipelines are sort of sort of straightforward. And again, there is some in-depth to this to start understanding that there might be some complexities somewhere. But again, what is a pipeline? Okay, it is a pipe and I have some line, all right, which is means uh, either water is flowing through that pipe and the district or the neighborhood or maybe some oil or some waste or some liquid or some information. But for us in bioinformatics, why 
do we care? In fact, bioinformatics is one of the areas that motivates the thinking of pipelines to a very good degree. Because we end up in bioinformatics dealing with lots of tools and options for different steps. So if I want to perform something like de novo genome assembly, I might end up running maybe three, four, five software. If I do sequence alignment, maybe I end up doing five, six, seven, eight software programs, running these programs. So how do I do it? Should I run program one? Okay. What should I do next? Sleep? Drink a cup of tea? Or do what until the program one finishes? So tell me if usually you would run a program that's going to take an hour or some hours. Tell me what would be an activity that would you do if you want to take a rest? Okay, just if you'd like to share that with me, drink something, go for a walk, take a nap or what? Imagine now you went to, to take a cup of tea and you met your friend there. You have not met for the last couple of weeks. You started talking and chatting and this program finished in 30 minutes and you guys have been talking for 45 minutes now it doesn't happen always but you have computation resources have been wasted for 15 minutes now because your computer is waiting for your next program so of course i want to have to run program two just when this one finishes and so here's the idea of a pipeline why do you want to run, first of all, each one separate? Why we don't connect them such that the output of this first program is going to be the input of this second program, and so on and so forth. This is going to become an output and then an input. And we keep going. What do we achieve in this case? Well, first of all, you can enjoy the, your 45 minutes because this is going to run uh, is going to run until it finishes. So maybe you enjoy it more. OK, maybe you're, maybe you're a workaholic, so you would say, no, no, I still need to make myself busy and, you know, I'm going to penalize myself and work half an hour. OK. And uh, a personal advice, work hard, but don't be workaholic. Never work is going to finish. Achievements, achievements are never going to end up. And, uh, you know, your health and life work balance is much more important than anything. And you would realize this once uh, something wrong goes in your health. And hopefully everyone is going to stay very healthy. So again, back to the point, let's enjoy our time with pipelines. This is one thing, okay? That's why, yes, in bioinformatics, we like pipelines. We stack lists of softwares, programs, and we make them run together. Now, what, is el what else? Well, for reproducibility. Remember, this is the big thing we are considering here. What about reproducibility and what reproducibility, what pipelines have to do with reproducibility? We finished that. We talked about, you know, containerization and so. Well, you know, containers are there to help me deploy and give instructions of regarding the uh, dependencies. But they don't glue software pieces. I have to glue it together. And if I decide on a set of programs that I want to glue together, and I'm able to store that somehow, I may serve reproducibility because next time I don't need to go and figure out each step separately. Imagine every time I run program one and there are some arguments and I keep playing with those arguments, which is always the case as compared to, no, I'm, I, I have my standard pipeline to run. But here is one thing. Why do we call it a pipeline? We don't just call it a program. Well, we are not actually writing a code here. We are stacking a list of programs that other developed. But what's going to be the biggest issue with that? 
I'm going to give you a moment because this is a very important question and it is a treasure hunt question. What could be the issue with stacking a list of uh, software or programs? Think about it for a moment. Okay, so if I stack programs, the first pro thing is how can I stack them? Well, in other words, this software takes an input, which is text file. This one, the output of this one is maybe a, uh, maybe some, let's say some sort of for a compressed file. Let's say the zip for the time being. Okay. Well, zip is not the text. It could contain text file, but it's not text format. Program two uh, expects text formatted file. And again, I'm making this example to make it appear that there is a link. Otherwise, it could be that programs one output an image, and then program two is requiring a text, but you should sort it out, right? What I'm asking, meaning that you would know you, you cannot link such or stack such programs into pipeline. But I'm talking about a specific case that it is very natural to have this program two comes after program one, but then we need to be careful with what is the output format and the input format here. Because their own developers did not develop them with that in mind that, well, the output, my output, I made my development of my software, so that is going to feed the other software. Doesn't make uh, you know sense. I don't know what is the other software. And what about program two? Well, I made my program to accept input from there. Sometimes it is the case, but sometimes it's not. So here comes all this discussion on pipelines and that there are specific languages to give instructions on what is the input and output from each step and make sure that there are clear instructions to maintain validity and reproducibility. So pipeline is a series of this interconnected computational tools, scripts, programs, code, software, whatever, APIs. And one of the standard uh, specialized softwares to handle this as what's called workflow management system. And this is software system designed to facilitate the setup, execution, monitoring, and coordination of tasks and processes. Okay. So some of the key features of a workflow management system, automation, include automation. Okay. I don't want to do manual work. I want to automate repetitive and manual tasks. It's helpful for process modeling because using um, this workflow management system, this system that helps me to put the different programs together can help me to show the process, uh, can help me to design process and show it and share it with others. Okay. Where I can discuss, collaborate, and so on and so forth. Pipeline tools, they usually would get different programs. For example, if we're talking about specific bioinformatics pipeline, we may look into data preparation, quality control, alignment, assembly variant calling, downstream analysis, and so on and so forth. The full sequential flow. We went through this example that you see here. I put this again just to refresh you. We have discussed this before in details. This is a pipeline and where we have a set of tools. OK, so once we finish with the first stage. With some quality check, some sample preparation and trimming, we go into alignment. And then we end up with some downstream analysis and we do try to get, you know, the quantification of our expressions. And then we can go all, even for post processing steps. So workflow management system is 
this system that can help me to realize the pipeline that we're going to build. OK, through it, as I discussed earlier, we can achieve reproducibility. We can coordinate tasks. It's a good way to uh, for data management. And usually we can actually use it to scale up and deploy parallel processing. Here are some examples because I kept saying, you know, workflow management system, workflow management, show me something. OK, this is Galaxy. Now, my first question. Have you ever came through a Galaxy? And as a treasure hunt question, just tell me yes or no. If no, make sure you visit usegalaxy.org. Uh, uh, if you know, if nothing comes out of this lecture except you know some few concepts, but also making yourself educated about Galaxy. This is very powerful workflow management system. OK. It could be the story again. Oh, we have been visiting a lot of things. We, last week we ended up with lots of databases and we're working with this terminal discovery and now we need to use this galaxy. No, this is part of, you know, just knowing different things and when you might need to use them. What's let me tell you something about galaxy is this interesting system where you can even deploy your own version in your own workplace and make it easy for others there to build their own pipelines through just drag and drop. Well, if you are going to build enough expertise in this class where you can write your own terminal and bash scripts, it's done. Maybe you don't need Galaxy. OK. But Galaxy is very useful for uh, giving some options to end users. When I've been working in this project as part of Genome Canada Fund, we had uh, hundreds of samples coming from different collaborators. It's not friendly for them to ask them to go in the terminal and start uh, using and writing some code or even calling my own script. So I've deployed Galaxy. We have developed our own pipeline. And I gave them the options on Galaxy to choose which pipeline they want to use and then give them tutorials, instructions, how they can upload samples into Galaxy and then start their own data processing. Which turned out to be very useful and very productive. It really speeded up or sped up the whole process of, uh, of doing uh, RNA-seq processing and alignment. OK. It is very powerful, user friendly Galaxy, but it has limited capa capacity when it comes to scalability. Uh, something, you know, I've experienced as an admin for this system. And sometimes configuration uh, of Galaxy can be a, a true headache. OK. But again, depending on the situation, it might be very useful. You can see here, this is an illustration of a pipeline in Galaxy. You just choose the name of the software, and then you drag it, you drop it here, and you start building your own pipeline. I mean, isn't this amazing? And you start gluing things together, and that's it, done. Now, of course, you need to make sure that these uh, programs are already installed in your system. But again, it's really very uh, productive. That's why Galaxy is, uh, you know, very admired system in the bioinformatics world. There are other systems, okay? So there is NextFlow. This is for building data-driven computational pipelines. NextFlow is also another interesting thing. It comes with its own way of markup language that tries to say give some instructions to build the workflow. So this is the process here that's going to say hello. OK, and then it takes an input value of cheers. And then it's going to print out that that's going to be the output. So echo cheers. So when I say build this and channel this workflow, it means pass each of those to say hello. OK. 
and so on and so forth. So it's like running this process for three times with three different keywords. Very simple illustration, but this is an interesting way to see the next flow instruction. It is designed for scal scalability and parallel processing compared to Galaxy. This is going to gain an advantage. But learning curve for those especially not familiar with programming might again be uh, some steep learn some steep learning curve that they need to go through. It's not that visual. Many likes visual things as compared to Galaxy. Another system is called Snake Make. It is Python based. So you're actually going to write some kind of Python uh, code. It doesn't have, again, a user friendly interface. And it's more limited, even with the limit a graphical interface that it's offering, it is much more limited. Uh, sorry, I said it doesn't have a graphical user interface. It has, it, I said it doesn't have an interface. Everything has an interface, but it doesn't have a graphical user interface or it has a limited graphical inter user interface, not like uh, Galaxy, of course. Okay, and there is what's called common workflow language. It's another language also, okay, uh, to write this thing. One of the advantages is that's language agnostic, meaning you're not gonna end up writing this in any specific programming language. It is very portable. We can run it on anything. OK. So. Let me. Uh, show this here. This is an example. Of one program that is going to take. Some commands and produce an uppercase text. So we're going to run a process. So what you see here is kind of meta information. Like this is describing the inputs. Do you remember when I talked and they said pipelines issue is going to be always inputs and input and output? So this common workflow language is trying to bring, you know, efforts into how to describe specifically the input and output. And this would seem an overhead, but this is where we have to be careful. What is the input? It's type file. The output is type file. Okay, what program we're going to do and conversion? So this is our first program and it's part of class command line tool. And this is another program that is going to um, count uh, the lines and that uh, those files. And they want to stack these together. So this is not going to be a class command line. Once we're going to discuss this, it is a workflow class. So here I can say inputs file going to be text file outputs file steps convert to uppercase so run the first cwl file and then run the second one and then give me the output okay so yes it's not maybe fun to see those and go through them but understand the focus is going to be usually input and output but once you know the software, it can be sorted out. Meaning once you know your own programs that you want to stack together, it's done. And then eventually we're going to run the whole workflow using this command. There are some resources that you can visit, like this next flow resources. It gives you already a list of pipelines. Many uh, portals or websites have an access or provide a resource or a repository for us where we can download some of the well-known pipelines or maybe some of the pipelines that others did develop. Bioconda, this is a repository for Anaconda. Uh, other resources, Abraham Bioinformatics. You can find ones on Docker repository. You can find also on Galaxy uh, um, website and so on and so forth. So when designing your own pipeline workflow, make sure that you are undefining the tools that you need and the resources. This is the take home message for this module. What resources do you need? 
make sure that you can break it down, the steps that you need to make. Always focus on the process. Think about the data. What is the input and output for each one? What scalability or performance we need to have and achieve? Are we talking about a few samples or a daily uh, processing of, of tens of samples or hundreds of samples? And how are we going to validate the pipeline? No question. No question. Whatever we do in this universe of bioinformatics, we always need to validate that. So please, even if you build a pipeline, start with a small case. Make sure everything works fine. Do some downstream analysis because if every, any single step that is wrong, everything would be ruined. And we're talking about pipeline to usually to process raw data. So you never want to waste efforts and maybe, uh, you know, big budgets by just a single step that was made there by mistake. That's why documenting a workflow and sharing that documentation is very important. So there are two activities that I want you to just, you know, share with me as part of a treasure hunt question. Imagine you were hired as a bioinformatics consultant. OK. And how would you address this issue, which is uh, a challenge of managing dependencies, ensuring reproducibility? You are tasked as part of analyzing large scale genomic data set. How are you going to address this now? Just reflect on the thoughts that we have discussed throughout the lecture. You don't need to go in, into in depth. Just give me your own decision, your own flavor of how you're going to do things. You don't need to go and tell me, well, for large scale genomic data set, what kind of task we will use that specific software in general as a way to achieve reproducibility. OK, and the second uh, scenario also that I want you to think about and report to me as a treasure hunt activity as well or question. About informatics researchers is working on protein structure prediction. Okay, and they want to share their work. They want it to be reproducible and so that other researchers can uh, are able to download it. So they want to have achieved collaboration, have peer review, and so on and so forth. And you are now a bioinformatics consultant. Here's the question. What solutions would you propose to them? based on what we have discussed in this lecture. And that's it for now, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much.